Let's talk a little bit about how proteins that belong in the nucleus get into the nucleus. There is something called a nuclear localization signal. An example is shown here. Proline, proline, lysine, lysine, arginine, lysine, valine. Proline and lysine and arginine all have amino groups, so they will confer a strong charge to this region of a protein. And that charge is shown on the left in the blue folded squiggled protein as being positively charged. And that positive charge is important because it allows the protein destined to go into the nucleus to associate with a nuclear transport receptor shown here in red and having a negatively charged region which will interact very nicely with the uh, nuclear localization signal that is so positively charged. That compound structure of a nuclear protein produced in the cytoplasm, bound to its nuclear transport receptor, that structure can now find a nuclear pore shown in this illustration with its nuclear pore fibrils. And upon binding to the fibrils or interacting with the fibrils, the closed nuclear pore will open up and this protein will be actively transported along with the hydrolysis of ATP that you just should have seen. And the, both the transport protein and the protein that's intended to go into the nucleus end up inside the nucleus. So this is a very much an active transport process. Only proteins with a nuclear localization signal get in, and only those proteins intended to be in the nucleus have evolved to have such a signal. There's more than one kind of signal, but only those that are intended to go in the nucleus will actually have it. What about mitochondria? Remember I said that mitochondria, like chloroplasts, have their own DNA and can actually produce their own ribosomes and make their own proteins, but they don't make many of them. So here's how mitochondrial protein import occurs. We have a protein in red in the cytoplasm with a green signal sequence in this case showing, interacting with a membrane receptor that links the outer membrane with the crystal membrane. So it's actually a protein complex that spans the intermembrane space of a mitochondrion and has protein components in the outer membrane and in the crystal membrane. And that's the receptor interacting with the protein. When that happens, there is a further interaction of the protein with another protein called HSP70, the little black structures. HSP70 are chaperone proteins that allow the protein produced in the cytoplasm to unfold and to cross a pore created by these membrane contact proteins. And the red protein that's going to end up inside of the mitochondrion is extruded through what is essentially a hydrophilic pore made up of membrane contact proteins that hold the inner and outer membrane together to allow this transport to occur. HSP, by the way, stands for heat shock protein. It's a very interesting name. Heat shock proteins were discovered in cells that were warmed to temperatures higher than they normally live at. And all of a sudden, these cells stopped producing most proteins and started to produce heat shock protein because they were being made at higher temperatures. We also refer to them sometimes as stress protein. So this cytosolic protein destined for the matrix of the mitochondrion is now being extruded through these membrane contact pore proteins. And once the, the polypeptide has gotten part of the way in, or as it gets in, heat shock proteins HSP70, by the way, stands for the molecular weight, 70,000 Daltons. The same heat shock protein is present both in the cytoplasm and in the matrix. So the heat shock protein can associate with the polypeptide as it emerges in the matrix and begins to help it refold into its functional shape. And as it does that, a mitochondrial signal peptidase cleaves the signal peptide, which is an N-terminal peptide, cleaves it and the signal peptide is eventually degraded. So that's how mitochondria get proteins from the cytosol. Something very similar, by the way, happens to get proteins from the cytosol of a plant cell into chloroplasts.